let us assert primarily that the mind exists. Firstly, that we ourselves exist as a species of animal life on earth able to ponder the nature of our own psychology itself is, one, a miracle of astronomically disproportionate odds, and, two, anthropic evidence a priori proving the existence of the mind as a simple, common sense, matter of fact. However, in so far as the mind that does the measuring cannot measure itself, it remains an entirely intangible object, and thus its substance remains elusive, even to itself. Because the greatest truth or most high fact the mind can comprehend is the tachyon light of hyperspace, experienced as the primary clear light in the moment of a person's bodily death, as reported on by almost all near-death experiencers. It may be easy to consider the mind stretched to its fullest and utmost extent as being itself this force field beyond light speed surrounding our local universe. However, the mind, even as such, would still experience itself through us as pockets of self-awareness inside of this otherwise empty energetic void. Thus, whether the mind is this endless ocean of energy past light speed, or only the drop of self-awareness that we are imbued with, we understand instinctively that we are describing the same natural substance in both these cases. Thus, it may be rightly said of the mind that nothing is impossible for it to comprehend. Although, in modernity, there are many things, even so simple as driving a car, that do seem to escape the analysis of most people. In modern Western civilization, most people function on autopilot by establishing a time-based routine. As such, almost everybody under the sun lives according to a daily clock. Work by daylight, sleep by night. Although this is not biologically necessary, nor specifically stipulated by any religious creed, it remains how human nature works inside the box of Western business culture. People then create deities that subconsciously remind them how to socially behave. Enter the primeval sun god, or son of mankind, who sits atop the pyramid, that man-made beehive or ant mound, to judge us all below. However, just because everybody is doing the same thing, doesn't make it necessarily the right thing to do. So it is with Western business culture, making its citizens slaves to a solar deity. Most people alive now would likely rather not have to keep such a time-based routine in order to survive and function in human society. However, those alive in Western civilization today find it exceedingly difficult to break free from these invisible chains that tie them inexorably back to the clock. People's time and energy are somehow not their own, but belong to their boss, whom taxes both relentlessly in exchange for money, enough to recover at least some portion of the time and energy they have to spend at their job. This is the mold for the prototypical common man of today as it is based on the conditioning of the Adamu workers of Sumer into their civilized lives in the earliest form of city-states 
some 4,500 years ago. So too, it may be rightly said, the mind may learn much very quickly, but it is slow to change even slightly on its own. So this mind of which we are possessed is a thing in itself and exists as such. The final metaphysical argument about it is only whether our own perception will persist post-mortem of our bodily vessel or simply fade away. Defining the mind as a highly evolved form of instinctive reflex that occurs inside the cerebra of likewise highly cellularly developed biological life forms, we may establish a gradient of consciousness between smaller, faster, though less complex brain structures, such as those of insects, on one end, and larger, slower, though more complex brain structures, such as those of reptiles, mammals, and ultimately human beings, at the opposite end, although this topology shouldn't be thought to end with us as its final pinnacle. The evolution of the mind has followed the evolution of the body in all cases wherein it occurs. That is, the more complex the cerebral cellular organism, the more self-aware it may be. At least, this is a theory the mind has developed about itself. The fact is, the mind is neither the droplet of reflexive sensation innate to the nervous system, nor the apparent infinite ocean of the hyperspace abyss, alone, but is, in truth, both. The central and peripheral nervous systems have evolved as a sensate antenna for receiving microgravitational changes in this hyperspatial, four-dimensional energy field. The awareness by the mind of itself as such has been written down, drawn up, and schematically diagrammed ever since the Vedic culture of the Iron Age, Indus River Valley, who first depicted the CNS as the seven, five spinal, two cranial chakras, and the PNS as the 12 meridian fibers. With the physical component of the mind, the metaphysical component of hyperspace perceives itself. As the four-dimensional shapes of hyperspace pass through our biological mental antennae, we experience their faces as emotions a bipolar mood cycle determined chronologically as a sinusoidal wave, their edges as thoughts or lines of reasoning, one premise leading immediately to the next in a stream of consciousness, and their vertex corners as ideas, either inspiration or distraction, depending on whether they lead us toward a better future or only leave us trapped in the quagmire of our present situations. The individual mind is thus sensate of the omnipresent mind via a form of hyperphysical sensation or sensory awareness. This hypersensitivity allows the individual mind to access the omnipresent mind and return with knowledge from its higher vantage point overlooking all possible situations in which for the individual mind to be trapped, about how best for any given individual mind to find its way free from its situational trap and to again be reunited with this omnipresent mind above. So it may be seen that the ego arises reflexively as instinctive reaction to one's immediate situation. However, that the ego dissolves into the omnipresent egoless mind more and more, the more detached the ego becomes from its immediate situation's concerns. For this reason, the argument may be made that a person has an ego, 
but God does not, because along this gradient of self-awareness of which we are only the present expression of a peak according to our own standards, God may be thought of as merely a universe-sized and far more highly evolved sort of brain, grown beyond the form of self-awareness by which we identify ourselves as individual people. In this case, the micro knows itself through the macro, and the macro knows itself by way of the micro, as both are reflexive of the other. The mind knows the body by the five senses that the body provides for the mind, by which for the mind to know its environmental surroundings. Sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. These correspond, respectively, to the biophysical sense organs of the eyes, ears, skin, tongue, and nose, most centered on the front face of the human head, although the head above the normal torso with its four appendages, two arms, two legs, does seem to by the body's pent out of four limbs and one head, have some apparent parallel in the sum of the body's five physical senses themselves, at least more so than the head having two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, and one mouth for a total of seven orifices, five of which are on the face. Although there are five bodily senses, there are only two types of sensory or sense-like experiences by which a behaviorally modern human being can know of the independent existence of the mind as a force field devoid of our materially physical reality. One is by a form of vision or second sight that may be experienced in dreams or reverie, daydreams, with the eyes shut, or else with them open as hallucinations, whether induced by fever in sickness, ingestion of poisonous toxin, or taking a psychedelic drug. The other is by a form of voice inside one's head that they both speak and hear themselves but which seems to originate from beyond their own capacity for comprehension in its potency. The proof this voice is, however, only oneself, and not the voice of any form of God, objectively verifiable as such or not, is that to converse with it is simply to have a conversation with oneself, soberly, it cannot tell you anything you do not already know. For the most part, a person's primary self-concept or ego speaks so loudly in their cavernous cranium it drowns out all else in their dim awareness. The conscious, self-aware ego as speaker inside the mind has a dual opposed counterpart in the subconscious, less aware of its own nature, yet no less potentially real, shadow self as listener. In most people, the inner child, the developmentally stunted victim mentality, fills this role, sitting in the darkest corner of the mind, rejected as a failure by the mature ego of authority. Hence, the dominant ego in most people speaks, and their own subconscious mind listens to it doing so, and these are the components that enliven the interior mental space which, otherwise, remains an apparent abyss. However, in some, however small a percentage of the population though it may be, the delusion persists that, beyond this normal or average range or spectrum of self-awareness, 
there remain alien or foreign sources for voices in their head. In this case, there are three different possible explanations wherefore these other voices in one's own mind may be coming. One, they may originate from within one's own self, such as with MPD, when a person's dominant self-concept is shattered into many fragmented alters. Two, they may originate from one or more invisible sources that, though apparently supernatural, remain believably real, such as with paranoid schizophrenia, wherein one fears long-distance mental manipulation by ineffable forces, including both ancient magic and modern technology. And three, they may be the minds of other people, such as with telepathy. In all three cases, the symptoms undergone remain nearly the same, regardless of the presumed source. One hears a ringing or unpleasantly high-pitched tone in their ears when they clench their jaw, which one does involuntarily when experiencing most forms of environmental stress. Likewise, there is a kind of buzz that one can both hear and feel as though one were afloat in water and, in a sense, walking on air, when one becomes pleasantly intoxicated on light alcohols, wine and most beer, mild opioids, or other forms of anti-anxiety or sleep aid drug. In the same vein as both these types of audible experience, when one is mentally delusional, such as in fever or on certain kinds of hallucinogen, one may be able to hear light, for example, if someone flips on a switch. When one is mentally psychotic, such as during a blackout period induced by hard liquor alcohols or by seeing red from sudden overwhelming stress, when the conscious mind experiences missing time, and another automatic pilot type of persona takes over. One may be able to discern from among all these forms of continuous flowing hum, independent and overlapping words spoken by different voices. Take note, the displacement of the ego or central self-concept during such waking trance states of mind is what distinguishes being psychotic, wherein the primary ego is bypassed by a usually silent alter, as apart from being psychic, wherein the primary ego remains in its ordinary state of mind, although it may be only more or less in complete control of itself and its immediate surroundings. So, if the voices in one's head are the thoughts inside the minds of other people that one is able to hear as if at different distances and may be identified objectively as being such, then one can experience these without it displacing their ego or adversely affecting them to any harmful extent. If I am sitting across from someone trying to guess what card they are holding, and they are thinking about the card, and I can read their thoughts, then I am more likely to be able to correctly guess the right card from the complete deck, as if by magic. Now, this ability in itself is not necessarily antisocial, although it may be, at sometimes more so than others, overpowering to the individual experiencing it, and lead them to have a psychotic break such as mentioned, can occur when drunk or overcome by stress. Situational training for the person so afflicted can increase their desensitization to this level of sensory awareness, which is considered oversensitivity only by most common dullards, 
who simply do not realize how difficult they are to be around. However, the voices in one's head, should one hear others than their own there, may not be the thoughts of those in one's own immediate presence, and in this case one is not per se experiencing telepathy, but possibly mind control, wherein one's mind is made subject to control by a distant and usually abusive force. In this event, the voices one hears may be aliens, foreign agents, ghosts of the dead, accursed cacodemon servitors, angelic or even one's own concept of God itself. All these are merely symbolic of the alienation of one's locus of control from one's self onto otherness. The problem with debunking the existence of any such supernatural form of otherness is that, in nature, otherness does exist, as manifest, obviously enough, by the plethora of different types of life forms and their apparently varied degrees of sentient self-awareness. One cannot, therefore, logically rule out the existence, presence, and influence of any form of supernatural or paranormal force in dealing with a person who hears voices in their head. Modern clinical diagnostic materialistic science and medicine may deny this, but they are blindly mislabeling thousands of years of our ancestors as delusional for their false belief in such transcendent and inexplicable entities and discorporeal intelligences. Not only does modern science discount the metaphysics of magic, it also denies, due to its lack of ability to explain, telepathy, and because of this, it ultimately lumps all causes for the experience of hearing voices into the least common group's reason for doing so, mental illness. This last cause for hearing voices, mental illness in the form of dissociative identity or multiple personality disorder, is increasingly common in the modern world after MKUltra introduced LSD to the masses, a hallucinogen that reduces one's tolerance to ordinary levels of environmental stressors. Nevertheless, this is a very different form of experience than being able to read minds or than being cursed by witchcraft. In the case of this effect resulting from psychological sickness, it is known to be triggered by traumatic levels of stress and to be identified with blackouts and memory loss. A person suffering from MPD has more than one personality living inside their mental space. As such, these inner people may be either more or less aware of one another and experience the presence of one another in various different ways. One model for this malady is that the primary ego, or central self-concept, is sitting in a chair under a spotlight, and whenever a trigger experience occurs, this personality simply gets up and steps off into the darkness, and another, usually very different, persona steps out of the shadow and sits down. This depiction is flawed, however, insofar as the model of the chair and spotlight fails to account for the seated ego's awareness of the other altars that remain in that scenario, surrounding them in the dark. Again, the result is that the dominant ego may experience these other selves inside its area of apprehension as voices in their head. To a certain extent, all of us are telepathic, whether to a greater or lesser degree by our unique innate nature, although this is usually dulled down by our species socializing nurture. Likewise, to some greater or lesser degree, all of us are being remote controlled by some distant, even alien, ideology, 
and thus rightly experience some form of paranoia. Also, all of us who are aware of our own ego in this manner, as a voice we hear in our heads, are also, again, either more or less, aware of the potential for the existence of alter egos to arise inside of our perceptual self-awareness, and thus we are all, more or less, multiple personality, dissociative schizophrenics as well. In so far as these other sources for voices in one's head may be considered legitimate as such, none of them should be seen as being either necessarily true nor necessarily deceptive. Whether one is telepathically aware of the thoughts of other life forms nearby them does not determine the content of these others' thoughts in terms of their honesty or deliberate falsehood. Likewise, the saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you, is true as well, insofar as paranoid victimhood is another sort of self-fulfilling prophecy itself. Likewise, finally, the alters of a multiple personality are no less independent selves within that person's mind, each with their own unique set of personality traits and characteristics. So, while some may lie, others might not. Thus, none of these should be seen as being necessarily honest, nor as absolutely deceptive. Each may yield some factual observations that prove true about the nature of our world and mind. Cognitive dissonance arises within an individual mind when it attempts to hold true opposite conflicting beliefs. For example, if an individual trusts two sources equally and each source accuses the other of lying, conditions of cognitive dissonance can cause as much mental stress as a severe bodily injury causes physical pain and often results in the formation of an autopilot alter ego that takes over control of the survival mechanism while the primary central self-concept or dominant ego faints. Reintegrating this alter ego into one's dominant ego takes at least as much time to heal as a mental injury, as a broken bone in the body, and if not tended to properly in a timely enough manner can result in stunted growth and can permanently change a person, just as even a small toe break can, if not set rightly, come to alter one's posture. Now, just as these three sources for voices one may hear in their head beside their own may be derived deductively and by logical reasoning, but may also be experienced and thus learned of directly. So too are there two varieties of vision anyone, sentient, can experience that are evidence for an independent and more intelligent source, and this origin may be discovered by both deductive thinking and inductive intuition. If we follow back to their source the origination of daydreams, while in waking sleep, that is, while in a mild meditative trance state, cognate to combined alpha-theta brainwave functions, we will discover they do not all come from within our own mind. And, likewise, if we question the veracity and beneficial usefulness of any visual apparition, we will be able to see through it, with crystal clarity to its source of origin beyond. An unlimited imagination, if also encouraged to flourish, has no need nor desire to cling to conventional modes of expression for those archetypes of our cultural collective unconsciousness while exploring its capacity for comprehension of possible meanings it is therefore reasonable to posit 
that such unbridled imagination may be responsible for all the great chimera and monstrosities ever recorded in myths, but that to the degree these descriptions are recorded, they have been compromised with the expectations and prejudices of a mass audience that is necessarily duller than that rarer creative wit. Such a luminous fool exudes charisma, but is also lost in their own daydream, and so, though they may attract followers, can only lead blindly, and thus over a cliff. Thus, those who seek the source and origin for their own daydreams and flights of fantasy are themselves not unlike those visual apparitions we may hallucinate while our brain is accessing usually unused neurons, such as while healing from neurological injury. These visual hallucinations take different forms co-determined by the chemical components of the experience and the preconceived symbolic beliefs of the person experiencing them. For example, an extracted entheogen fabricated in a chemical laboratory will yield markedly distinct results from the same sort of chemical when administered in its natural format. In short, one may see any kind of devil or god. However, in dealing with these visual hallucinations as well as with those daydreamers, who seemingly dwell on this threshold between waking and sleep, it is less imperative to ponder their appearance or paths than it is to plumb the depths of their presented character, that is, regardless of what we imagine in a hallucination, no matter how paranormal or horrific, it is only what we can learn from it and communicate back to others that is in any way useful, and of that only what serves to improve the conditions for all life on earth that is truly beneficial. So, if, as stated before, there is no absolute metric for determining whether anyone, in trance or not, or anything, real or imaginary, is being 100% honest and accurate in what they show or tell you, one can only determine validity and value using their own individual mind. All this leads us back to the substance and nature of the mind itself. In so far as autonomous apparitions, purely imaginary or visually seen, are as reliable as any other person. In so far as auditory and visual hallucinations may be either more inspiring or distracting depending on their source being either a better or worse future world, in so far as only certain truths or facts of knowledge lead us to such a better future world, and these are very few, and in so far as it appears highly likely these few certain truths we seek are those guiding us back toward mental reunion with hyperspace, that unending egoless energy field, then it doesn't truly matter whether the sources for information we perceive are de facto real or solely imaginary, only whether whatever information we do receive gets the micro-scale consciousness closer to its macro-scale counterpart or not. The mind is that which can be both subject and object, both the hand holding the apple and the apple held in the hand. The mind is simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, singular and plural, individual yet cosmic. It occupies a quantum superposition, condition or state, wherein it is at the same time and always independent of itself in the form of individual self-awareness and omniscient in the form of its capacity for comprehension. While compressed in the lesser state, the mind is able to experience itself through an ego, 
but cannot perceive all outcomes accurately across all time. While expanded in the greater state, the mind is able to perceive all outcomes accurately across all time, but cannot experience itself through any form of ego. Just so, the mind exists in both these conditions right now, as sentient life forms below and as hyperspace above. So this hyperspace mind appears to be guiding its divided parcels back together into itself and thus forms a shape over time not unlike a thick rope that is uncoiled into many strings in the middle but remains unified into a single cohesive whole at either end. This overall format for our cosmos does appear accurate. The manifold galaxies are like the axon dendrite, synaptic gaps inside our own cerebral frontal lobes, and as such form a vast network interconnecting all together along a single gravitational fibrous strand. Tracing back through the history of cosmology and the spiral curvature of complex cellular development in the upper brain stem, we may further compare earlier cosmological stages to earlier phases of neurological evolution, tracing all the way back to the original cosmic Big Bang and to the pineal gland inside our own brains.